weeks back, I'm hanging out with my buddy David, which is funny because my name's David as well. So we were just a couple of Davids hanging out looking at uh, vintage computers and vintage electronics. He's got an old PDP-11, which is just such a cool machine. But we chose that day to hang out because there was a retro computing meetup going on locally. So we loaded up and we set off for the meetup, but David told me that we need to stop at a parking lot along the way because a buddy of his, DJ, is going to meet us and uh, David needs to hook DJ up with this old data terminal that he has. So yeah, sure, absolutely no problem. So we pull into the parking lot, DJ pulls into the parking lot. It's the first time I've met DJ, so I'm a little tentative at first, but it turns out that he's just the nicest guy ever. Uh, so I totally start opening up and talking probably too much about all of the old vintage computing projects that I'm currently working on. And I mention that I'm working on this old mini computer not many people have heard of called a Centurion. And DJ says, Oh yeah, I've got one of those. Uh, <laughs> my reaction was probably pretty similar to a lot of uh, you guys' reaction, which was, mm, I don't know if I believe you. So I pulled my phone out and started showing them pictures of this machine because, well, I'm the type of person that has pictures of their vintage mini computer on their phone, but I was showing him pictures of it and he says, yeah, mine looks just like that. I said, that's insane because I haven't met anybody else who even knows what one of these are, much less has one. But if he has one that is massive, maybe he's got some software that I don't have, or maybe he's got some working drives so we can read some of that software, or maybe he's even got some hardware, some cards that I've never seen before. But we had things to do, places to be, so we had to part ways there. And we went to the meetup, but I'm going to be honest, I don't really remember the meetup because in the back of my head, it was just Centurion, 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 going over and over and over again. Uh, but again, I had to go home after that. I had work to do, and so uh, I kind of got lost in time. And then, well, we really started picking up steam on this thing. And, well, we got some really cool stuff happening with this. So we, we got it talking to the terminal. We even got it running TOS, or Test Operating System, running some custom code, which actually ended up being laureled, which I think is hilarious and uh, awesome at the same time. But all this while, I got in touch with DJ and I was keeping him apprised of some of the behind the scenes things that we were working on. I let him know the first time it booted. I let him know the first time we got it to run TOS. He was there watching the evolution of this machine with me. And he said, well, if there's anybody that has a chance of getting my Centurion going, I think it's going to be you. So it took us a little while to get our schedules to line up. But once they did, I went up to uh, where he was and, well, here we go. Hey, thanks, man. No problem. Uh, nice hello old shirt. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's a nice little hello old shirt. You got a nice hello old shirt too, dude. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I heard people can find the link to these in the description below. That's absolutely right. People can find a link to uh, both of these shirts down in the description below. So if uh, maybe you want a nice hello old t-shirt, there is a link in the description below. But uh, thanks for bringing this in, buddy. No problem. Take it easy, bro. Take it easy. Super nice guy. But... Yes! Now we have two Centurions here in the garage. Whew, this is epic. Oh man, there's so much cool stuff going on here. But you may be wondering if this is indeed truly a Centurion. It looks very similar, but there are some noticeable differences. The chassis in particular is very different, but I'm not going to hold that against it because who knows what their chassis supply was like throughout the 70s and 80s. But this front panel is the big giveaway. It doesn't say Centurion anywhere on it like this one does. It just says computer controls, which is a little too generic. Uh, and, well, if you think that something is off about this, you are absolutely right. The story behind this Centurion, and it is kind of a Centurion, is amazing. A couple episodes back, I mentioned that I really want to make a documentary on the history of the Centurion company, because even though they were only a company for about 10 years, their history is insane. And this machine actually plays an incredibly pivotal role in the history of Centurion. 
Now, when Centurion first started, there was only about four or five employees. They were all family members, and they were building the CPU4 systems. That's uh, CPU4 because there were three CPU cards and then one DMA card that took up four slots. And they had a core memory card. They had a Sykes tape drive. And they were really cool systems. Uh, they were also incredibly competitive for the price point they were at. And as a result, the company started to grow. And as it grew, they uh, upgraded the CPU 4 to the CPU 5, then ultimately to the CPU 6, which is the system that we have here. And these systems were really competitive for the price point. And they were so competitive, in fact, that they caught the eye of one Ross Perot. Now, it feels weird for me to be mentioning his name with stuff that I'm involved in because Ross Perot was a presidential candidate. He was such a strong candidate that some attribute the result of that presidential election to the fact that he ran. But that's neither here nor there because Ross Perot was also the CEO of EDS. So EDS bought Centurion. Centurion became a subsidiary of EDS, and from here they started to really grow. They, at their peak, had about 300 employees, and they were building these machines as quick as they could, but they were also building a lot of other really neat things at the behest of EDS. Now, whenever they would build one of these machines, well, they have to source a bunch of stuff from different places. For example, the drives are made by CDC, or Control Data Corporation. The power supply is made by Rio. They didn't make those in-house. It was easier to source them from companies that specialized in those things. But what Centurion did specialize in and what was completely proprietary to Centurion were the cards for the computer itself. Now, whenever they would need to build one of those cards, they wouldn't just build one, they would build a lot of them. So if, for example, they needed uh, to build some memory cards, they would need to order 100 memory cards. But they knew that the card manufacturer would mess up three or four of the cards. So they would order 110 cards just to be safe. And sure enough, the manufacturer would mess up three or four, and so they'd throw those in the bin, they'd build their 100 cards with their nice wave soldering machine with all of the components that they had, and then the spare cards that were left over, maybe four or five or six of them, they would put in storage for later use. Well, it turns out that some enterprising, enterprising, that may not be the right word, uh, horrible individuals were stealing extra cards and taking them home. And then once they were home, they would source all of the individual components, all of the chips, all of the ICs, then they would hand solder the cards. And so now they had genuine, genuine Centurion cards, but they didn't have the rest of the stuff to put it in. But it turns out that the rest of the stuff is all sourced from different companies. Remember, the drives were made by CDC. The power supply is made by Rio. The cabinet is just a standard 19-inch uh, half-height rack. And so they could source all of that from the same companies that were supplying them to Centurion. And so they would, they would source everything and they would build this. It is a counterfeit system. It is a Centurion that is not a genuine Centurion. And the customers had no idea. It looked like a Centurion mini computer, except that's not good for business for the real Centurion people. So when uh, old Ross Perot, when he caught word of this little bit of corporate espionage, Ross Perot is famous for having a uh, zero tolerance for any of this kind of malarkey. So, Centurion got the axe. This machine cost 300 people their jobs at Centurion and sent the company bankrupt. Now, this machine actually looks a little more genuine than a proper counterfeit machine because a proper counterfeit machine was hand soldered and these boards are most definitely wave soldered. And talking with Ken, what he said is that after the counterfeiting ring got discovered, uh, the counterfeiters were forced to buy genuine boards from Centurion to make the customer machines complete, whole. And then Centurion could continue to provide official support for those machines. Uh, so it's got genuine cards in it. It's got genuine CDC drives. So the only thing about this machine that is not genuine 
is the front panel, the chassis, and the power supply. But the power supply is made by Rio, so it's as close to genuine as we can get. So this is a, this is a wild kind of half counterfeit, half genuine machine that is incredibly important, important for the history of Centurion. Uh, so it's just it was such a cool story that I had to share it with you guys. But I'm sure you're burning up to know what is going on inside of here, particularly what cards are in there and what's inside this little blue box up top. So let's pull all the cards out, take a quick look at them, and then I'll show you what's in here as well. All right, let's go ahead and remove all of the individual cards and get them over onto the bench so we can get a better look at them. And I've actually gone ahead and already disconnected all of the ribbon cables. So we'll just go ahead and slide all the cards out. This is the CPU6 card. And yeah, that is a multi-wire card just like mine. And then over here on the far right, it looks like we've got a, yep, a memory card. And yeah, that is a good looking memory card. And then right here in the center, we have a multiplexer card. And just like mine, it's got those four ports on it. Yeah, there we go. Now these two cards on the left here should be a disc one and a disc two card. And yep, that looks correct. We got disc one and disc two written on them. Now this final card here is a really interesting one because it's actually two cards together and it says FFC on the front of it. Oh, that one's really exciting. All right, here's the CPU6 board and it looks actually completely identical to the CPU6 board that's in uh, the genuine machine that we have. It's got the same AM2901 bit slice ALU down here the same AM2909 uh, bit slice sequencers. We've got a collection of ROMs over here for the microcode. And then we have these high speed static RAM chips that we believe are used for the internal registers. There are eight 16 bit registers and each of these eight registers is duplicated in an interrupt level. So as far as the program is concerned, you just uh, move data in and out of these specific eight registers. Now, if somebody else on a different terminal requests something of the CPU, the pointer to the interrupt level changes. So whatever the current program was working on with those registers stays where it is, and then the machine works on the next interrupt level. And there are 16 interrupt levels, allowing the CPU to essentially multitask at an extremely high level. If you want to know more about, well, any of the boards that we're going to look at, or specifically about the opcodes or the microcode or anything to do with the CPU6 itself, there's actually a GitHub wiki that we're slowly building up that has a ton of information on it. So definitely go check out the GitHub wiki for more information on how this CPU6 board works. Next is the memory card. And uh, well, it looks actually completely identical to the 128K memory cards that I have in the genuine machine. So that means that this is a 128K memory card. Now, unfortunately, this memory card has seen some water damage, it looks like, uh, particularly in this bottom left corner here. The ICs are very, very nasty. Uh, and I can see some water damage on the PCB itself. These 4116 DRAM chips are no notorious for going bad in the best of conditions, but fortunately you can replace uh, 4116s with 4164s with a quick simple little mod and the 4164s are a lot easier to get your hands on. So that may be what's in the future for this one, but uh, we're certainly not going to put any power into this until we get these bad ICs out of here and uh, clean the board up considerably. All right, here's the multiplexer board. Uh, now it looks identical to the uh, multiplexer card that I have in the genuine system, with the exception of the main uh, UART chips that are up here. The genuine system uses COM 2017 chips, and the chips that are in the sockets are actually uh, Intersil IM6402 IPL chips. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference between the Intercell chips here and the COM 2017 chips are in the other multiplexer card. Uh, but if we're lucky, these Intercell chips are not bad. 
Uh, and we can get away with just a simple clean and maybe replacing some of these electrolytics and then the multiplexer card will be up and going. All right, here's the disc one card on top and disc two card on bottom. These are the two cards that work together to control the Hawk drives. And on the disc one card here, we can actually see it says disc slash auto load on the top, just like the DSK slash AUT card that I have for the original system. However, this is a much newer revision. We can see, first of all, that it has a date code of 4082 on it so this card was built in 1982 but also it doesn't have the very old EEPROM uh, right here in the center of the board that the original disk AUT card has and I believe that's because the original disk autoload card was for the CPU 4 system so the bootstrap was actually in that ROM chip that set on the disk autoload card but when they went to the CPU 5 and the CPU 6 systems the bootstrap was moved to the back plane and the bootstrap that was on the disk autoload card was disabled which meant that the original autoload card would work totally fine but for later revisions they didn't need to put that IC in there which is why that IC is missing on this board but otherwise this board looks like it's pretty close to the same as the original disk auto load board that I have and the same goes for the disk 2 board down here it looks really similar to the original disk 2 board that I had in the genuine system and finally we have the board that I am the most excited about the FFC board looking at the front here it feels very reminiscent of the CPU 6 board and the CMD board because it's got AM2901 4-bit bit slice ALUs on it. Now it's not using 2909s, but it's using 2918s. And these are probably sequencers. I'm not sure, I'll have to look up uh, that number later. But it's got a collection of ROMs right along here that it's going to be the microcode for whatever this is emulating. But unlike the CPU 6 and the CMD board, this is not a multi-wire board. It's just a standard two-layer board, which means that there wasn't enough space for all of the chips they wanted to fit. So it's actually two boards connected together. And so if we flip it over, we can take a look at the backside, which has another full dual-sided circuit board with a ton of stuff going on. But that begs the question, what is the FFC board for? Well, FFC stands for Finch Floppy Controller. So Finch Floppy Controller, what, is, what does that even mean? Well, we can figure out floppy pretty easily because we know that uh, Centurion had an 8-inch floppy option and floppy is still common vernacular to this day. Uh, but we clearly don't have a floppy drive here. We've got just these two Hawk drives. And by the way, these Hawk drives look way cleaner than the Hawk drive that I received with the genuine system. But uh, that doesn't answer what Finch means unless we start thinking about how CDC liked to name their drives. We, we have here the CDC Hawk drive. The other drive we had was the CDC Phoenix drive. Both of these are birds. CDC also had another drive called the Wren, W-E-R-N. That's also a bird. And so we can kind of piece it together that Finch, being a bird, is another type of CDC drive, which is exactly what's inside of this little blue box up here. So let's open the door and take a look inside. And your eyes do not deceive you, that is a full-on 8-inch multi-platter sealed hard drive. The Finch drive came in several different options. This one is a 32 megabyte drive. We can see the control board for it over here on the right. And there is some janky looking power stuff going on over here with some tape. But we have a full on proper Finch drive with a Finch controller card. And being sealed, these things were very, very tough. So there is an incredibly good chance that there is still data saved on this drive. Now, I'm I'm not going to power it up as it sits because the power setup over here is incredibly janky and I don't trust it to not catch fire at all. So we're going to need to extricate it from this blue cage, set everything out, make sure it's all clean and power it up slowly and properly. So there we have it, a genuine Centurion system and a counterfeit Centurion system under the same roof for probably the first time in history history <laughs> that is it's just 
such a wild thing to think about that now that I've said it out loud, I'm starting to get goosebumps. It's just so cool and so wild. And I am beyond excited to have this machine here now. Not because, ooh, exciting counterfeit machine, but because of what it means for both of these machines. We have three drives, and if we're really, really lucky, if the original owners of this system were super vigilant about backing up the operating system, there could theoretically be a copy of the operating system on each of these drives, which gives us a phenomenal chance at recovering some of the original software. Now, that's probably unlikely. The operating system was most likely just stored on one of the Hawk drives. Now, the air filters on these have a date on them of 1994. So this system was used well into the mid-90s as well. Uh, at that point in time, it would have been fairly obsolete. But that raises the question of why it was decommissioned. Was it decommissioned simply because it was getting old and slow? Or was it decommissioned because of a head crash? And there's only really one way to find out, and that is to get the Hawk drives out of it and take a look at the fixed platter. That is a terrifying prospect, and I am not going to do that by myself. First of all, because these things weigh about 65, 70 pounds, and I can't lift one by myself, so I need help to get it out of the machine. But also because Mr. Romaine specialized in the Hawk drives, and if anybody can help me get, it, get these things up and going properly, it's him. However, the Finch drive is much lighter. I can move it around by myself and it's sealed. There is a really good chance that there is absolutely nothing wrong with that drive. I can just plug it in and it'll work. And we have the FFC card and a working system with a diagnostic board. So we can put the FFC card into this system, run tests on it, make sure it's working, then plug the Finch drive in and test it out and see if there's any data stored on it. So whew, we can start getting some work done on the Finch drive even before we take a look at the Hawk drives. So what's the ultimate goal here? What's the end game? Why did I want two of these machines so badly? Well, the genuine machine here, it's just so special to me and I really love the direction that we're heading in with it. The idea of building custom software for it, custom hardware, that's just so cool. I'm super excited about that so I want that to continue with this system. Now if both Hawk drives are good, I am going to transplant one to this system. Uh, it would be nice if we could have both the original operating system and all of our custom stuff going on at once with this system. This is kind of our play field now. With this system, I really want to restore it into a museum piece and hopefully someday donate it to a museum. Uh, but, well, the counterfeit chassis just doesn't look right and I, I love it and if this was the only one I had I would not think about changing it in the slightest but it's so close to being a genuine Centurion system it has genuine Centurion cards we just need to give it that little bit of push to make it proper and that little push is just changing out the chassis and it just so happens that I have a genuine Centurion chassis up in storage that originally had the Phoenix drive installed in it when I got this machine. So what I really want to do is I want to bring that genuine chassis down, transplant one of the Hawk drives to that chassis, move the card cage and the power supply to it, modify the front panel on that chassis to look exactly like this chassis, and then build that up into a fully working Centurion system with the original operating system and original software for essentially immortalizing the Centurion computer in history. So that's our goal, to have one to play with and experiment and check new things out with and another one to build into a proper museum piece. So. <laughs> I'm super excited about it. I hope you're super excited about it. And I hope you're amped up to see what's on that Finch drive because I am going nuts. I'm ready to see what's on there so bad. But we're going to do that journey in the next episode. So I want to thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you then.